recording. I guess my... Uh, Boy, that's a pretty cool setup. Yeah. <laughs> I really... Um, I'm, I'm impressed. Yeah. yeah. That we can use this too. Um, so, yeah. Welcome, Jim... Um, Jim uh, Cowell, right? Uh, Kroll. Kroll, yeah. Kroll. Entschuldigung, uh, uh, as you say in Germany. Uh, welcome to the Escapist Corner. This is, um, yeah... Uh, a podcast interview format today we usually tend to have uh, sometimes we have monologues sometimes we have dialogues um, and today we have the honor to have you which is you are the the um, uh, CEO of probably one of the most respected uh, <laughs> training uh, training programs for coaches out there uh, called OPEX um but before we start going into the depths of uh of opex um um maybe we can talk about a bit where where you come from and sure. why you are in the fitness industry to start with yeah i um t to not be too long-winded on yeah. it you know you don't need a whole history but i i grew up as an athlete i i love sports i loved playing sports and as I got older, I realized I loved learning sports, um, and I ended up playing tennis at Penn State University, and so I, I got a glimpse of strength and conditioning and what that could look like at a pretty high level, and really enjoyed it. But I was, in my head, I was already on kind of a business track, and, and so I was a finance and economics major, got out of college, and uh, went to work trading commodities for a hedge fund of all things all right um so i did that for five years and really enjoyed it but just had that pull back to sports or back to some kind of training um i always was pretty good at sports because i worked really hard and mm. so i wasn't necessarily the most skilled i was i was one of those hard workers that did okay yeah um so after five years at the fund, I recognized I wanted to be back in some sort of a fitness arena or sports arena. And so CrossFit was getting a bit popular at the time. This is 2009 at the time. So I started learning CrossFit, started doing a little bit of CrossFit, got certified. And I, I like to tell the story that I liked CrossFit because it was capitalism. You know, I liked mm -hmm. it because in 48 hours, I could go open my own business and slap CrossFit on it. Now, <laughs> clearly there are some trade-offs that come with that, but yeah. uh, it was great for me. And so yeah. I, I moved to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania at that point and, and opened a gym with a buddy of mine. And we grew that gym and opened a second gym, grew that second gym. And then ultimately I sold my shares, you know, to my business partner. Um, as I was building those, I met James Fitzgerald and mm. OPT, which was Optimum Performance Training back in the day, and really fell in love with the concept. I, I really appreciated the principled, truthful approach that James put on the table. He said, these are the facts, and here's how we can interpret those facts into a framework with which to train somebody extremely effectively. And so that really captured my attention. And after I sold my gyms, um, he and um, Mike Lee kind of recruited me down to OPEX, and I said, let's, let's rock and roll. I was recruited in as a coach, actually, and so I was one of the remote coaches at the time, and about, you know, I'd like to say about 15 minutes into being at OPT, we not only rebranded to OPEX, but I recognized that we needed a lot more work on the business side. And so mm -hmm. pretty quickly after I got to OPEX, I went from coaching and, and transitioned away from coaching and into the business side and kind of worked my way into um, my now CEO role mm -hmm. and have just loved the experience. I really like being in fitness. I, I've said it all weekend. We're here at the Coaches Congress right now in Sweden, and I, I tell everybody that I love talking about fitness business because mm. i think that the people in it are fantastic i think that they mean well not like every other not there are many other businesses out there that people don't necessarily mean well and so i appreciate that about this and i love how fast fitness is changing and so i think there's a lot of opportunity in this market if if we can play it correctly so mm. um that's where i am right now and i appreciate you having me on yeah <clears throat> uh many many good points there in your story that I would like to um, go into. But the first thing that just struck me was 
um, you talked about uh, tennis and um, when we I think a couple of years ago we, we were talking actually about that in, in the podcast and it was the trans what's going to happen with CrossFit it was this was before uh, CrossFit made this kind of yeah. health and everything but we said uh, we saw like the throwdowns and all these small events uh, happening everywhere and we said like well the future of CrossFit will be you know like tennis we will have all these tournaments and yeah there might be one main one but mm -hmm. uh and yeah now just back just reflecting and when you told uh, talked about tennis it's uh how it actually has transformed into that now you have yeah. these like uh independent contests uh, uh in in the entire world now taking place and and i don't know what the end game is because yeah. the trademark of CrossFit is so important to the corporate side of things. But think about the difference between tennis and CrossFit is that tennis is just a thing. It's you just know? a sport. Yeah. Right, exactly. Yeah. So does CrossFit ultimately end up being a sport and, you know, let's call it CrossFit Health or whatever yeah. rebrands into something else one day? Maybe. Yeah. Um, but I think that the sanctional events are ultimately, I think that's probably a good thing. Um, mm -hmm. It opens up new markets for people to compete. It gives more people live touch points on what it feels like to be at these events. Um, but there's a long ways to go to yeah. get it to tennis. <laughs> yeah, 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 for sure. Uh, I mean, for sponsorships and everything. Mm -hmm. But uh, but it's def uh, definitely, I mean, it's a big transition we see so crazy competent people now uh, just regarding the fitness which was you know unbelievable 20 years ago that you could have so many people with that certain level of um of fitness so it's definitely you know it's like a gladiator gladiators game happening now every yeah. weekend somewhere which is uh, crazy and uh these gladiators from now this age are you know a completely different animal yeah compared to what they had back in the days i competed at the crossfit games in 2015 um on a team with opex and i i feel like even since 2015 the game has completely <laughs> changed yeah um so i i was i loved the experience but man i'm not even sure that i could yeah. go back at this point if i was 10 years younger <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I gave up those games yeah, long yeah, ago. <laughs> yeah you and me both <laughs> how 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 um so how how does it work with because there is, uh, um, I mean, uh, as you said, uh, OPT or OPEX uh, uh, grew out from uh, James Fitzgerald's uh, ideas, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they've been kind of cross-linked with CrossFit for a long while. But um, how is the relationship there between uh, CrossFit and OPEX? Because I know there's a lot of CrossFit athletes doing following OPEX uh, and there are also OPEX uh, facilities mm -hmm. you know, right or um, how, how many facilities and, and athletes and coaches oh, do boy. you have? So um, at, at, at this point technically the company has a parent company which is still OPT that's just not a branded you know it's just an LLC mm -hmm. underneath that is OPEX that's the coaching education in the gyms and then Big Dogs is where all the remote coaching clients sit. Um, so those are two separate companies at this point because yeah. we really are kind of doing two different things. Yeah. Um, we have, gosh, I, I don't know what the numbers are. And, you know, regionals aren't even a thing anymore, but I think we've put seven or 800 athletes into regionals and yeah. 75 to 100 athletes into the CrossFit Games. Um, you know 500 clients around the world right now so we, we have a lot of touch points into the crossfit arena with mm -hmm. you know through our athletes and coaches um our, we've got you know 60 gyms right now around the world probably the easiest thing for people who are first hearing about opex right now is we like to do things in a personalized way so we're not doing group training we're doing all individualized design you know most mm -hmm. people just call it id mm -hmm. um that is what James like that's the ethos is mm -hmm. that 
everybody is unique and requires their own program, lifestyle, design, nutrition, etc. Mm. And so that's what we really do. And so our coaching education is designed to teach coaches how to understand how to coach humans. And so to get down to that level, you have to ask yourself what the human needs. And so if you don't get to an individual question to ask, it's you, you can't actually optimize a program. And I don't think anybody's denying that idea, right? Mm-hmm. You know, uh, group training has trade-offs in a good way and a bad way, and personalized training has trade-offs in a good and a bad way. So mm-hmm. we've just chosen to go down the personalized track because we believe it's the most optimal way for a person to do fitness and ultimately to um, experience life. Mm-hmm. Um, so those are kind of the two main differences between CrossFit and OPEX. Yeah. Uh, the relationship is not great, unfortunately. You know, mm-hmm. that goes way back. Um, mm-hmm. But... Uh, I'd like it to be better. It's just that there's been some tension for a long time. Yeah, I, I can just recall it was something uh, because back in the days there were not many affiliates, uh, and I think um, like I, I don't I don't know I don't know the backstories any, anyway about CrossFit or or uh, OPEX or OPT, but yeah, I, I guess when when everything grows and it starts to grow fast, uh, oh, there's yeah. always going to be some some uh disalignments Mm -hmm. um but uh are do you have many or is it possible or are there like affiliates that are crossfit and opex or Mm. is it or is it like no you have to be opex or you have to be CrossFit? yeah we we have lots and lots Mm -hmm. of people who do let's just call it some version of a hybrid where they're doing group training and they're doing individual design OPEX gyms Mm. would only have personalized fitness inside of them but we've educated thousands of coaches who are utilizing those those principles in gyms that might not be called OPEX Um, we just wanted to make sure that for our brand Mm. it was very clear what we were offering inside of that gym and James is very clear that he wants to make sure that for the coach, not even for the owner per se, but the coach has a place where they can coach for a long time. Mm. That's his biggest challenge, generally speaking, with group coaches is that there's not generally a long-term trajectory mm. for a group coach, um, which unfortunately is one of the reasons why CrossFit gyms have difficulties with coaches leaving and opening up gyms very close is because there really isn't great opportunity not all the time but Mm. in many situations there's not great opportunities for the coaches yeah no we can we can definitely see uh, see that in uh, and uh, i mean there are many many companies and many affiliate owners have discovered this that if you don't offer some kind of path of Mm -hmm. uh um you know um career then then you you will lose those coaches and yeah. and uh, i think you have like guys like the mad lab guys and mm-hmm. uh, uh two brain which is also um also kind of talking about this you have to have a s- different revenue streams and uh, and offer people you know uh, a way to to grow yeah um i'm uh, certainly i'm certainly biased in this thing yeah. um I think that we're in a world that's going to demand a lot more personalization. So Mm -hmm. I think that gyms who are utilizing personalized fitness in some capacity, Mm -hmm. even Nicole talking with Healthy Steps Nutrition, right? She, it's the same concept. If you start having an individual relationship with people, there is higher willingness to pay from a consumer. So retention is higher. Yeah, Yeah. I I think so. So those touch points are critical we Mm -hmm. are hugely in the mindset that you have to build relationships with your clients Mm -hmm. and again we believe it's through personalized way but even in group gyms when you offer that level of personalization it's an upsell you Mm -hmm. know there is an opportunity to collect more from clients for a higher level service which connects them more to you which ultimately gets back to retention Um, you know, so again, I, I'm biased on it, but I think that mm-hmm. that's a good thing that a lot of people are looking at, and a lot of people are looking at personal training as a large revenue stream for their gym. So we do it a little bit differently than personal training, but I, I totally understand the concept. Yeah, I, I mean, I I, I, to, I understand all, um, also, and I I don't judge anyone for doing however they want to do, but I'm 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 also thinking 
the benefit for <clears throat> just so the benefit with having uh, individualized uh, coaching or or ID or is that you can you can have higher pr price point as you say <clears throat> you can have maybe more time for your money or more money for your time mm -hmm. which allows you to maybe you know do the good Samaritan thing uh, meaning you can if you have enough wealth and money then you can start to uh, offer services to uh, people that don't have that money mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, I, I don't know I uh, I think this was one of the lessons that um, or lessons something that uh, also Glassman talked about uh, uh, this was like okay you know you start with your your individualized clients and nobody says you have to scale up to a group yeah. training model however um, your goal, uh, or I mean, for him, the why CrossFit even exists today is because Glassman had a high paying client that paid him to sit in his garage for six hours for I don't know how many days a week, uh, if he would come and need to have PT, but he was paying full salary for six hours. And this guy was, uh, um, I don't know, high earner, uh, top tier in some company. Uh, and he mostly didn't make it home for mm -hmm. a PT, but Glassman was there. And what did he do? He, he trained uh, probably, but he wrote all the things for the journal and created the asset of CrossFit. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I, I'm not saying everyone has to create their own CrossFit journal or their own OPEX program, but that just allows you to having those high end clients will allow you to, you know, if you're passionate about, we say your vision is to, you, you want to help as many people as possible out there, <clears throat> then you might have resources to, you know, develop your online programming or, uh, or you know, have really good pay, good paid uh, coaches for a group classes uh, because uh, your revenue or your profit is not depending on having sheep sheep mm -hmm. staff on, yeah. on those group classes. Right? I, I, I think from what I generally see in group training side, more people are struggling to make enough money. Mm. And so I'm, I'm not a believer in adding so many services that you water down your main service. So some people who are offering three or four different services haven't actually figured out their main service offering. And I think that's a problem. Mm. Um, you know, so if, if you've got CrossFit on the door and you can't make CrossFit work, that's a problem. Mm -hmm. um, but I love the idea of as you have a solid base product or base service, you can make substantially more money with an individualized program on top of that because you don't necessarily need additional clients to make more money. It's lifetime value of each client that walks through the door. Um, that's a huge metric and I almost look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Mm. I generally default into gyms aren't safe mm. first. And so a lot of gym owners want to get to this transcendence level, but they can't pay their bills. It's, it's emotionally impossible mm. to do that. Um, and so I just want gym owners to think about what is my economic engine essentially mm. and how do I make that engine run effectively so that I can, to your point, make more interesting decisions with the time that I have left. Mm. Um, so I think that people just overlook the idea of getting to safety first mm. and then building on top of that. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, uh, good points. Well, yeah, I, you, you had uh, a talk yesterday uh, and something that stuck to my mind was um, the power of words and what words you are using. And um, I was thinking like, uh, the Jim, he, he's, he, he's a marketing guy. <laughs> no, but because um, this, uh, I mean, something I learned in marketing, it's, it's like, okay, the power of words, copywriting and so on. Um, and my reflection was, yeah, uh, you're totally true. You need to, I mean, this comes from role playing. You can, of, of course, uh, try to get better at just, you know, one incremental step at a time, but um, your emphasis on 
you need to work on this just as much as you need to work on your whatever it might be your snatch or yeah. or, or um, when it comes to sales uh, to know the packages or whatever it might be so um, where did that realization come from uh, for you um, yeah I'm, I am not actually a traditionally trained marketer mm -hmm. um, with each role that I've had I mean I did virtual I did really no marketing when I was a hedge fund trader yeah I had to market at a very local level when I owned CrossFit gyms and now you know at a global level I've had to really teach myself how to market much more effectively because mm -hmm. you know we've got resources but we don't have unlimited resources so I have to make sure I understand what our big vision on the marketing side is but I'm also still the person who's teaching our coaches and gym owners business and so when I hear their stories and when I hear their challenges, often I'm, I'm just paying attention to the words that they're saying. And unfortunately, when I dig down under the surface with coaches, they don't actually know what they're saying. Mm. They haven't thought about the words that mm. they're using. And so it, it's probably because I've had so many conversations, I mean, thousands of conversations with coaches that I've just recognized how important that is. And then I go out, I love to test it, right? So I'm sitting here talking to you, recognizing how you are mm. moving and shaking based off of the words that I tell you so that I can sort of inform myself, mm. you know, what to say next. Mm. Um, that's how I approach a room. That's how I approach a conversation. It's, it's what, where am I? Who are the people that I'm talking to? And ultimately, what, do, what will they respond to? So one of the quotes that I love is that it's not what you say, it's what they hear. And so I think that, you know, words always impact that. Um, and one of the examples I used yesterday was just the difference between um, weak and cowardly. You mm. know, so if I say that somebody looks weak, there's a little bit of grayness to that. Mm. But if I say that somebody looks like a coward, mm -hmm. there's no gray. Huh. And, and so people will react differently just by the choice of words in that statement. Um, gym owners... Uh, and coaches, when they're working with clients or prospective clients, you need to be aware of the words that you're using because they are eliciting a response every time that you say them. Mm -hmm. And when you don't recognize that there is a response, that's when you get into trouble. Um, and people can mask a response a little bit, but there is a response. So it's, what is the response that I'm going for? What are the best words in my tool belt you know to to throw out in the conversation to try to get the response that I'm looking for now sometimes I just want to have a conversation mm. but I'm still listening to how they're reacting to the things that I'm saying and that's been extremely beneficial for me for all the coaches that I work with um, perhaps just because it leads to a different level of awareness of what's going on around you um, but it's been a concept that's been it's worked extremely well mm. so far mm. <clears throat> yeah, I, uh, I, I was, uh, I fell in love with you a bit, but um, uh, in that moment, because I, I really thought um, that that was a, a very good key point <clears throat> that many people might not take up on. And, um, um, and you talked about also, um, you know, um, how important it is, and you draw, drew the parallel to uh, how how much time you have to make an impression on <laughs> on people, right? Uh, if it's um, you know thirty seconds or two minutes, uh, you quoted um, or quoted, but you said like uh, Orrin Claff's book "Pitch Anything." He has two minutes to make a two a two billion dollar deal, more or less. And um, mentioning books, w do you have any other uh, good? good uh resources i'm uh, i'm getting better at this question yeah. i was terrible at this question before um I, I for anybody listening i always accidentally default to the books that are recent because they're yeah. more on the top of my mind but yeah. i'm going to try to expand um i'm i'm fascinated by behavioral finance behavioral economics mm. cognitive biases stuff like that mm. so i love books like Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman. Love that. 
And I also really like the derivative books that touch mm. on what Kahneman and um, Amos Tversky put together. So I really like Jonathan Hyde's books on the righteous mind, yeah. um, the coddling of the American mind, happiness hypothesis. Those were great. Um, some of the recent books coming right back to recency. Mm. Um, I read Bob Iger's. He's the CEO of Disney. I read Bob Iger's memoirs. They were it was fantastic. I think mm. one of the reasons it was so good was because the storytelling in it was so vivid. Because we know Disney as a company. It's not 200 mm. years ago. It's right now. Yeah. And so he talked a lot about the big deals that he's made as the CEO. He talked about working with Steve Jobs. It was, it was a really cool book. Mm. Um, but actually, I was recommended um, The Culture Code by my cousin. Daniel Coyle wrote that. He also wrote The Talent Code. Maybe some folks have read The Talent Code. Okay. Um, really good book on creating environments where people are more engaging and more supportive of the mission that you or the business is in. Um, and just a quick hit on that you have to create an environment of belonging of safety and of future and so even you know thinking about having a conversation with a bunch of people in a room or a bunch of clients you have to always be thinking about how you're making them feel connected how you're making them feel safe and how you're making them see that there's a future in not just this conversation but where you intend to go hmm. um and that's actually, you know, people have joked with me over the last 24 hours. I make fun of myself a, a good amount and I make fun of uh, Americans because we're over in Sweden right now. Um, and I told a story about how uh, essentially when I was in kindergarten, I was told that I was a, a rubbish reader, right? Um, I do that because it makes mm. me vulnerable to the room, mm. which makes them feel a lot more safe and like they belong. Hmm. And so the moment that I create that vulnerability, the room is changed. Hmm. And so when I tell people that, they start to pay attention for who is willing to do that and who's not. And what I've found is that when I haven't allowed vulnerability of myself, hmm. the environment, the culture, etc., has never been as good. Maybe that's something uh, <clears throat> you, you could just um, um, tell the the... the 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 listeners uh what that was about the the, the story there oh sure because uh, i think that's a good takeaway for people to maybe relef reflect over so. yeah well my whole presentation yesterday was about stories and words and and um you know as richard as, as you heard me say yesterday i like to boil things down into a simple idea and then try to expand where where things need expanding and so if it's about stories and words then we talked about words, and so one of the stories that I told, well, let me give a little bit better context. Stories are everything. They connect with people more effectively. We remember them. I think most people kind of know that concept at this point. But the way that I wanted to present it yesterday is that all of our clients and prospective clients come into these conversations with their own stories that you as a coach have to understand and you don't necessarily have to overcome them you know i'm not trying to challenge a coach to like overcome mm -hmm. the story you simply have to be empathetic to them being there and so i told a story about how when i was in kindergarten my teacher um put me into a slow reading group she didn't mean anything by it she was just trying to bucket people into probably the most appropriate reading mm -hmm. groups but i didn't understand that as a six or seven or eight year old and so i took that i was a bad reader with me for 25 years and so i didn't even i didn't i didn't yeah. realize it you know you yeah. don't even realize it yeah. and then when i was early 30s i started asking myself i'm like i'm reading 50 books a year mm. you know i'm i'm reading a book in a day mm. uh, you know i i've done all this work like i took two speed reading you know kind of courses yeah. and books but but the story that i told myself was that i i took them just to get adequate yeah. you know i wasn't taking them to be great i was taking them to be adequate because yeah. of that environment that i was in you know at six years old and it's clearly not true you know yeah. what i mean i'm not a bad reader no. but that's what i had in my head for decades mm. and clients are walking in with that that 
type of a story in one of a million different places. So mm -hmm. maybe they lack confidence because they, they were told that they were ugly as a kid. You know, it, it's, it's that times a thousand. And, that, so, that, uh, and that's also where I think the words yes. become important. And as you said, your teacher might not meant anything bad with mm -mm. it. Uh, same thing I, th I think parents might do to their kids and they might say something just like that, uh, fix this, and then they throw out some word commenting what mm -hmm. they're doing with the drawing or anything, and they might think, well, I draw like shit. Yes, and, and, and <laughs> we, we don't have, we don't get it as yeah. kids, and so most of all of our stuff comes from when we're kids, and yeah. so we're always trying to figure that out, whether we realize it or not, we're trying to figure it out. <laughs> so that's, yeah. a, that's a common story. It's because when I was small. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's so true. Um, you know, I just think about, uh, I don't obviously know what the teacher said, but I don't remember any commentary around, oh, hey, you know, this is the group that you're in, but you work hard and, you know, you, mm. you'll you be an amazing reader or whatever. Now, yeah. notice that I said amazing versus adequate, right? Yeah. Like I'm changing the words specifically, but I suspect that she didn't say that because I think I would have remembered that because I had, mm. I'm a massive growth mindset guy. So mm. if somebody says, if you work hard, mm. you'll be okay. Mm. And I don't remember any of that in the mm. context. So let, if we assume that that wasn't said, that's unfortunate mm. because there's probably a lot of other kids who, you know, were kind of left for dead, you know, mm. in the sense of the word, who maybe aren't as lucky as me and didn't figure it out, you know, mm. and so it just, it's unfortunate and teachers have really difficult jobs i'm not trying to downplay that it's just it's such a big responsibility that i think i think it's um yeah i don't i don't see like teachers as a special category i'm thinking like it's in every person's um connection to anyone mm -hmm. uh but like yeah parents and kids uh first to force to uh because in uh, one way, I think um, if you're if you're if you have a very safe, good um, family, meaning the kids have a, a safe zone in that sense, they can they can be the worst reader, or they can be the you know they can develop in any direction, but they know uh, they're going to be loved in any way uh, at home. Mm -hmm. Always ex at like acceptance in that sense. There are borders. There are certain things that our family is doing. I'm not saying everyone has to confirm to the same laws in their family, but there are like a set of rules uh, at home that makes that's the safe zone. Mm -hmm. Do you know what's happening here? Right. And that's going to make you have much more buffer outside than when you're eight or nine. And you might have a similar experience that you had with uh, with a teacher saying something stupid. Yeah. Or, or maybe it wasn't stupid because yeah. I probably was a bad reader, and you know, at yeah, six years old. <laughs> maybe that, yeah, maybe that pushed you all the time to, you yeah. know, keep on reading. You never know. Maybe yeah. it's the best thing in the world for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. Uh, but uh, I'm just, I, I'm thinking as soon as long as you have like a solid base, mm -hmm. you can have something to uh, grow out of. Um, and um, going back to behavioral uh, economics with. Uh, Daniel Kahneman, I don't know uh, if you heard, he, he was on a, uh, I, I think it was a conference or, or so, uh, uh, but he was on the podcast of Sam Harris, mm. and uh, they were talking about, uh, you know, system one, system two, and and um, uh, he asked him, like the godfather of <laughs> behavioral economics, like, so um, it's your impression by knowing that this these biases and so on has that helped you anyway and he said no no yeah <laughs> well i i i'm i'm i i fully believe that i think um we have to set up our own systems yeah. to check um and make sure that we aren't making poor decisions mm. so i think the most important thing that we can recognize is that we are going to make bad decisions mm. um but a lot of people you know they read a book and they think okay well now i can control it so, mm. no 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 you you can't control mm. it that's the whole point point. Mm. and i think the biggest thing is that 
when stress enters the system, that's when everything changes. Yeah. So I might be able to fully control my, you know, let's call it my reaction to my reaction. Mm. However, the bigger the stress, the less able I'm going to be to be able to do that. And mm. I just simply need to recognize it, number one, and number two, have external systems to check and balance to make sure that I'm I'm not making mm. a poor decision at an inopportune time. And I think that's one of the reasons we put good people around us, you mm. know, and we make sure that um, we put different types of people around us so that they don't have the same type of emotional reactions to the same things mm. so that we can make better, more rational decisions as a group. Mm. Um, yeah, not to say that one person can't make genuinely good decisions most of the time, but we all make bad decisions. Uh, yeah, uh, and we see it all the time. I think, it's, as you say, you, you need to be good at just, uh, or it helps you, it gives you a tool to kind of dissect what happened, mm -hmm. right? Why did I, oh, that was... Yeah, uh, totally get it. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, all right. Then you, you don't have to, you know, uh, spend too much time on... Um, yeah, you're you're not wasting that much energy on on trying to solve a problem that is unsolvable in mm -hmm. that sense. Um, Interesting thing on that is uh, kind of going back to awareness. What has helped me a lot is asking better questions in those difficult moments, and I think that the questions bring awareness to what's going on, but it also brings a lowering of that stress because the second you start to be more aware, it starts to dissipate. Mm. Um, and so for a lot of, well, anybody, I think, listening to this, ask yourself why, or excuse me, ask yourself what you're feeling, and then ask yourself why you might be feeling that way. Mm. And a lot of times, there are some fairly simple answers that almost immediately start to dissipate mm. the stress that you're feeling, because you have just kind of, you know, you have just put a light on it mm. essentially yeah. and so once the stress starts to go down you start to make more better logical decisions and that's usually where training helps mm -hmm. people too because it kind of gives you a, a a distance to a problem i mean we see yeah. this constantly people you're you can be out stressed and you're like should i have to do all these i have to i have to to, to do list i have all these meetings and then you train and you work out you come out of training and it's like, okay, what am I going to do? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And and suddenly you can start to be more more rational. And mm -hmm. you can also say, okay, I'm not going to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. But you're going to be f much more in a state of, okay, I'm just going to focus on these things. Yeah. I think that's one of the reasons, you know, there's a, a number of reasons. But one of the reasons people like CrossFit is that you work out hard enough to be present. Yeah. You know, so people got used to, I don't know, bicep curls and then check their cell phone mm. a lot and that is less present mm. than crushing yourself mm. with speed mm. um, but i think to your point that helps people when you get present it it takes the rest of the stuff and just puts it aside for a little bit yeah. and starts to de-stress the system mm. you know well i want to be careful with de-stressing because hard workouts every day i'm not a fan of but mm. the idea of being present calms the mind yeah and i mean you can meditate if you want yeah to, if you're good at that but uh most people have easier access to that state through training um i mean i would love to be a a, a mind mindful yes. guru but uh i'm working on that too um but um i i always um i always ask people questions uh not only uh, through this medium but like our members, for example, and um, I want to kind of understand what drives them. I mean, when it's at the gym, I want to know, okay, why, why, why do you come here? Uh, and why did you, uh, what's your aspiration? Where, where are you like going to be in 12 months or whatever it might be? Um, so my question to you is, uh, what drives you? Like what, what's, what, what makes you, you know, go up in the morning and travel to Stockholm? Uh, what's your trajectory here? Uh, I don't know what my trajectory is, so I'll open by saying that mm -hmm. I'm I'm open to a lot of different long-term ideas. But mm -hmm. what definitely drives me 
Mm. Um, I have to have growth. Mm. I have to have it. If I don't see a pathway for growth, I feel like I'm dead mm. or dying, one mm. of the two. Um, and growth to me is sort of synonymous with the second thing that drives me, which is learning. Mm. I demand to learn. I can't not learn. Um, so if I'm not growing and part of that is learning, I'm not interested at all in what whatever the thing is that I'm doing. Mm. Um, I used to think that it was money. It's, mm. it's not money. Mm. Um, I used to think that uh, it was winning. Mm. I don't think it's winning. And notice that I'm not positive but i don't think it's winning mm. i like to win i hate to lose you know but i think it's more about the investigation of something mm. um, i love to dig into things and i love to understand how systems work and mm. and the systems that i like are uh, there's always a relation to people so I, I love to better understand something like politics, not mm. because I'm picking a side, but because I want to understand why we're even doing this thing. Mm. You know, mm. I want to understand how the government interacts with businesses. I mm. want to understand how our behaviors impact what a government does or what a business does, which ultimately affects millions or billions of people. Mm. They're all correlated. Mm. It's all connected and I don't know. I'm going to spend my whole life trying to figure out the most, the biggest part of that connection possible, I think. Yeah. Um, and I mean, since you're, you've done a couple of different things through your life already, I, how old are you, by the way? 36. 36. Uh, all right. Uh, 83? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. One year older than me. Um, and you've gone through uh, a lot of things. Um, what made you have the courage to you know go into those different <laughs> endeavors all the time um I, I don't mind going to zero now mm. i'm actually fairly risk averse in the sense that i don't like doing things that i can't wrap my head around so mm. i don't like putting on dumb risk i don't like gambling i don't mm. i don't like that at all mm. But I'm also very analytical. Mm. So if I can wrap my head around a game plan, I'm lucky enough that I'm also extremely confident in myself. Mm. So if I if I see a game plan and I see an opportunity, I'm willing to go to zero knowing that that opportunity should yield mm. some sort of great result. Not always money, not always whatever. It's just, mm. it's growth, right? So I, I went to zero a couple times in sports. Um, learning a brand new sport. So I mm. played tennis at a Big Ten school and I really wasn't playing tennis competitively at all until I was almost 17. Mm. So I was very late in that game, but I went all in mm. when I went and loved it. Mm. Um, but looking back today, just as a side note, what I loved the most were my coaches in high school yeah. because I learned the mm. game. That So I was learning and growing. That's what I actually liked the most about the experience. Mm. Um, after I worked at the hedge fund, which, you know, obviously there's just unlimited financial upside at a hedge fund, mm. I went to zero to start my gym, mm. you know, a local gym. Mm. People told me I was out of my mind. <laughs> I wouldn't have changed that for the world, though. And yeah. we made it very successful financially and, and had a great business, had a great time doing it. Mm. And then when I sold that, I went to zero again when I went to OPEX because I was hired on as a commission only coach. So yeah. I literally had a zero salary when I came into <laughs> OPEX. Um, yeah. So, but I saw, I saw that there was an opportunity and I knew that one, I don't spend much money. Like I just, I'm not a guy who's extravagant. So yeah. like I can handle going to zero for a little bit as yeah. long as there's opportunity on the backside. Yeah. Um, and I also like to work. I, mm. I like to build stuff and... Where does this, does that come from? Hmm. I mean, when I was young, let's go back to being young, I, my dad used to go to work every morning at 5 or 5.30 every morning. Yeah. And he did that so that he could be at my sister or my games, you know, in the afternoons or evenings. Mm. But I saw that and I just, for whatever reason, I just respected the hell out of it. Yeah. I, I just thought... Okay, that's that's how this thing should be done. Mm. Um, and I also saw how much 
the people who worked with or worked for my dad respected him because he was always willing to put himself on the line for his people. So I kind of got that concept shown to me. My dad mm. is the opposite of a cocky guy. He's not mm. that at all. Mm. I saw him do these things and I wanted to emulate that. And mm. so to this day, I'm almost always the first in the office, mm. almost always the last out of the office. Um, not because I think I need to overdo, you know, I, I don't need to be better than people. Mm. I just want to make sure that I'm doing what is necessary to help the business the most effective way I can. Mm. Um, and I also like what I'm doing, yeah. you know, so that helps. helps. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I, I don't mind working on the weekends. I do it every weekend. I, 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 but I'm investigating something, right? Mm. So when you said, you know, you kind of looked at me as a marketer, I really enjoyed investigating marketing because mm. I didn't understand it well. I knew that there was growth trajectory and I knew how much it would benefit the company mm. if I was mm. better equipped to do that. Mm. Um, and so depending on where we are as a company, I guess I better mm. get close, the, depending on where we are as a company, I'm... I'm having to investigate something because we don't have unlimited resources. Mm. So I need to understand something well enough to know, do we put resources into this thing to benefit the company or not? Um, it's a long winded answer, but I, I, I like working hard. I feel more satisfied when I've worked hard at something. Mm. I had to learn how to work smarter as I was growing up because I just work more hours and do stuff. Mm. And so, I'm, I'm probably still learning how to work smarter mm. in reality, but um, it's it's amazing how I'm always done with my work. You know mm. what I mean? Like mm. I, I work until I'm done, mm. you know, so there were nights at the hedge fund. I just didn't go home because mm. I wasn't done. Mm. Um, and that's something that I never demand from people. That's not fair, mm. but I, I look to see if people are willing to put that kind of focused work into something. Um, because that generally tells me that they are interested enough in that topic mm. where time just kind of melts away. Mm. So can we put people in good enough roles that they, uh, again, it's not about having to work that much. It's mm. about enjoying what they're investigating. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Um, I think that's a good point for most people trying to figure out what they enjoy and what they're good at and like, <clears throat> when talking about finishing stuff, I think that's also something you can learn. Um, I, I mean, I, I learned it through work and working is that I, I'm a guy, I have no problem starting stuff. I can start a podcast, 10 podcasts, mm -hmm. I can do all that stuff. Uh, however, I'm, I'm from personality trait, I don't like to finish it. Mm -hmm. I, uh, this podcast, when it's done, it's going to take me a lot of effort to make that coming out mm -hmm. right and uh i think some people are very good at like yeah, yeah. i really suck at that so i'm just going to delegate that every time uh so uh, i think it's but it's also something you can learn so if you uh know like i do like i suck at um uh, or i don't enjoy finalizing because mm -hmm. i'm already done like i yeah, want to start yeah. with the next one so uh so I, I i know this so i i simply know i have to sit down i have to do this and and don't quit before I, i'm i'm done and uh, i've learned this the, the hard way also not just only in business wise but like project wise where you have deadlines and so on it's like yeah i i love to create i love to um, develop these things but okay clients needs to have this uh before midnight and there's no option to be in late mm -hmm. so okay then it's you know uh, as i learned that uh, in my early 20s i would say of working also working a uh, crazy amount of hours um it it gives you some kind of uh reference point of mm -hmm. what you can do and then um, if you, I mean, if you jo enjoy f finishing stuff, uh, then that's, that's all great too. Like, yeah, do, do that. Well, <laughs> and I think too, um, I, I've got focused work on my mind because that's what, that's one of the principles that Carl and I will talk on tomorrow at the mm. Coaches Congress. So, 
um, to put just to put it in context, when I'm mm-hmm. saying focused work, I'm saying that it's not about doing work; it's mm-hmm. about doing the right work thoroughly um, and effectively. And I think some folks who love starting things just have too many things going on to mm-hmm. effectively finish something. You know, so it's like I would ask the question. You know, if you were sitting here and we were in a consult, I'd ask, well. Um, how important is this podcast to you? Yeah. And we start to connect it. I know you mm-hmm. do this, these things, but um, you'd start to connect it to all those different factors. And then if there are 10 other things on the plate, I'd say, well, how important is that to you? And yeah. let's talk about the actions. And then mm-hmm. I would actually probably try to get three or four things off the plate so mm-hmm. that the things mm-hmm. that were the most important, mm-hmm. you had the time and weren't overwhelmed by time for the finalization of something like a podcast. Yeah. Um, it, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a real challenge, you know, because there are, it's like so many of us are now in small businesses, right? Mm-hmm. Where you, I, I like to say you have to be the artist, the manager and the entrepreneur mm-hmm. when you're in a small business, you got no choice, right? So yeah, yeah. we don't have all these resources to, to mm-hmm. offload the finalization of a podcast, mm-hmm. but I, I suspect that, but it's easier now than ever before in yeah, one way. So true, very true. <laughs> I suspect, though, if you make the podcast big enough, I know the first thing that you're going to delegate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Uh, and, I mean, I, I already have those options. I'm, uh, it was just um, just a um, uh, an example in this point. But, um, yeah, I, I, think, mm, I think most people are a bit confused when it comes to hard work. Uh, and I think, I mean, this is also cultural. This is depending on where you from, come from. Um, we're right now in Sweden. Uh, there's a certain work ethic uh, in, in the workspace here uh, when it comes to how much work you're going to spend working. Um, same thing in Germany and another thing in, in, in the U.S. because of social security systems <laughs> and everything. That makes a huge, huge play like... Uh, and role uh, just like you said okay then you start to start to investigate what's the politics of this mm-hmm. uh, what's creating like these people not showing up to work like what's that i don't yeah. i don't know that but maybe that's more also the personality trait yeah um and um how did you discover that you're like in a growth uh because i mean these are hypothetical uh, um hypothetical expressions uh of how people are like we just had this this uh, other speech today where it was like okay some people are are um uh, amiable some people are analytic and mm-hmm. some people are and we have these like the books where you have different seven hats or whatever it might be where did you uh discover that was that also like reading a book and um I, I'm I'm sure that the however many books that I've read have helped me to see that more clearly. But I, I think really you feel it through experience. So as I learned how important awareness is, I started asking myself more questions. As I started asking myself more questions, I started to realize that when I wasn't in a position that I thought had growth potential, mm-hmm that's when I felt the worst. So I might be at the best company in the world, but if I don't see a pathway to grow either mm-hmm. in the company or in my learning, et cetera, I, I don't wanna be there. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it's that simple for me. Um, that's just, that came out of experience and question. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I, I started to really feel this maybe in my mid twenties, I really started to understand it in my let's call it late 20s early 30s mm. and now i'm trying to set my life up to make sure that i'm respectful of mm. it mm. um i suspect when i'm 80 years old i'm still going to want to learn and grow mm. it's just going to look different yeah. you know so where are you in kind of your seasons of learning where are you in your life where are you in your career where are you with family etc mm. and i want to make sure that i put myself in good positions in each of those key areas to grow and to learn you know so mm-hmm. i don't have kids at the moment if i do have kids one day i promise you i'll i'll be very interested in learning about those kids mm-hmm. you know and learning how how kids develop you mm-hmm. know 
that's just what I like. Yeah, you know? yeah. You you will experience a lot of growth. <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> and um, uh, looking at your role now as a CEO, <clears throat> uh, do you have any mentors that you uh, or you know or role models or mentors that you are working with uh, to kind of you know up your game or? Um, so I've, I've been very lucky in my career. One, my dad was fantastic. Um, oh, he is fantastic, I should say. Um, my, my grandfather was fantastic. Both of them were pretty high level business people. And now I've got a family member who was a very, very notable company CEO that's mm. been very beneficial for a conversation. Mm. I have another person who is extremely high level in a very big company who is very helpful for me i and maybe i talk to them once a quarter you yeah. know but they're very willing to investigate some of these bigger questions with me mm. um and that's what i value highly and they value the conversations as mm. well because they're in a different stage of their life they yeah. want to mentor back yeah. um in the fitness industry i i've certainly learned from a bunch of people james certainly changed my entire perspective mm. on what training should look like mm. and how people connect to training and how behaviors ultimately dictate how successful people will be in fitness and health and life mm. um but i don't have a let's call it a formal mentor relationship mm. with no. anybody at the moment i mm. have done some business groups here and there they mm. they were okay for me but i have the best conversations with those people closest to me. So mm. I've got a really close group of friends I went to college with. Right. We chat you know, maybe once a month and jump on a video call every quarter and yeah. really suss some big stuff out. Mm. And those conversations are invaluable to me. Yeah, because I'm uh, thinking making bigger uh, business decisions or if, if I mean, as uh, as a CEO, you can also be very involved in, uh, in mm -hmm. uh, HR stuff too, right? And and sometimes you're very left on your own, right? Yeah. To make those uh, Yeah, calls uh, well, you know, for example, um, Eric from Aleco, right? The mm. CEO of Aleco, um, I, I had a great conversation with him yesterday. We intend to jump on a call. I'm hoping mm. that that turns into great ongoing conversations where, you know, we can throw ideas off of one another. Mm. Um, uh, you know Jason Crow from PN. We chat often, mm. um, and he's been a great you know partner in crime. And yeah. uh, I'm I'm building more relationships with with folks like that. I yeah. certainly have great conversations with James as well as our COO Carl, as well as Megan Sweet, who's our director of sales. So I I feel like I have a great feedback loop, mm. even inside of our company now. Where um, hopefully it's not only my perception, but um, where they're willing to tell me if I'm potentially leaning in a direction that doesn't make sense or whatever. I think that they're willing to tell me those things, mm -hmm. um, which is very important to me. And then I, I always want to have people outside of the company that can help me with some uh, industry perspective or global perspectives that either I don't know yet or I'm just not seeing in the moment. Mm. Well, <clears throat> do you have any specific... Um growth uh objectives now for opex yeah uh, uh in the states by or globally or in europe uh, do you have any yeah we if, if i boil down to what we want to do i said this yesterday mm. we want to teach people the truth about fitness mm. you know and so that's what we were put here to do basically mm. Um, I don't say that in an elitist way. I mm. say it in a principled way. Mm. There's a lot of nonsense being flung out there that's not backed up by any scientific data. Mm. We want to make sure that we can teach coaches and ultimately even more people than just coaches because coaches work with clients, um, how they can live the largest life possible for themselves mm. and, and through fitness. Mm. Um, all the people that we work with when they implement good behaviors good nutrition and good fitness feel better you yeah. know it's just it's an amazing concept and all the coaches here are trying to do the same thing and um i, I just think that there is there's a big opportunity to do that in a big way so what we want to do growth wise at opex is to educate more coaches mm. um and we've got 
the specific numbers we want to hit, you know, over mm. certain periods of time. Mm. Um, of course, we want to grow revenue and profit, etc. Uh, any business, I think, should. But mm. we are ultimately, and this just goes right to James. And anybody who's ever met James or seen him knows that he is about helping coaches. Mm. And so we want to empower, help as many coaches as possible. Mm. And and we know that our program is more in depth than others. So mm. we are realistic with how many we can impact. Mm. But the ones we impact, we want to deeply impact. And mm. so that's kind of our game. So if Aleko is, excuse me, Aleko is um, premium strength building, right? Mm. And I'm just going back to Eric's presentation yesterday. Mm. We want to be premium personalized fitness coaching education mm, okay. and we want to be the best in the world at that also uh connecting to what eric said uh yesterday is also uh with what you right just said you need to have the profit yeah so you can could keep on you have growing. to have resources yeah, yeah. so you can yep. keep on growing uh so um because yeah sometimes people are just oh yeah they have high, high profit yeah so we can grow exactly <laughs> like, there's nothing wrong with that i mean <laughs> It's funny in in fitness, I don't know where it comes from per se, but there's this feeling that we shouldn't make money, you know, that Mm. people shouldn't have to pay for fitness. And I'm just Mm. thinking, why is that? Mm. Why? Why is that pervasive in the fitness industry? But it is. And I think that if we have a valuable service, we should demand money for that value if we don't have a valuable service nobody will pay you for it yeah um but i I want our coaches to make a lot of money if they earn it you know Mm. and if they give a great service over and over and over and over again they Mm. should earn money think about the value that a coach provides to somebody Mm. i mean they're the preventative brick wall that should Mm. never be broken for disease for uh, I, i would go so far to say that even mental challenges oftentimes can be helped, mm. not fixed, but helped mm. with good behavior, good nutrition, and good fitness. Yeah, we, we see this all the time. Yeah. So, uh, um, and um, I want, yeah, I don't know, we're kind of, I want to be a bit respectful of yeah. your time, but um, uh, do you have any OPEX gyms in Europe right now? Yeah, we um, the UK has been growing pretty well. We've got yeah. uh, Bristol, Manchester, Gatwick, Coventry is opening, um, and the, some of these gyms are quite new, so they yeah. might not even be fully up in you know websites and everything. Yeah. But um, um, Oland in Finland is opening up, and uh, the Netherlands Narden is opening up. Um, okay. Uh, we're now we're in South America as well. We're in Mexico. We're all over the U.S. We're up in Canada. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's it's been a cool ascent. Now keep in mind that business we certainly have no mm-hmm. expectations of of having thousands of these gyms, right? Yeah. We, you know, the, the biggest we will probably ever get is a yeah. couple hundred. Yeah. You know, and and that'll be great for us because mm-hmm. really at our core we're coaching education. The gyms are the best outlet for people to continue to grow on the business side and personalize fitness, mm. you know, but we want to make sure that we educate coaches first. Mm. Yeah. Um, sounds super interesting. Um, at least it made me, um, much more curious, uh, in what you're doing. Um, cause I think you're doing it for the right purpose hope so. and, yeah. and right cause. Um, so hopefully, I mean, this also makes some other people uh, uh, curious on what you're doing and uh, and so on. But um, I guess, uh, yeah, where can they find you? Uh, if they yeah, <laughs> uh, my best social media platform, funny enough, is actually LinkedIn. So I'm just Jim Kroll, C-R-O-W-E-L-L on yeah. LinkedIn. I'm at Kroll Jim, again, C-R-O-W-E-L-L on Instagram. Mm. Uh, and then our website is opexfit.com. Uh, and then you can kind of find everything that you would need on, on Opex Fit. Um, mm-hmm. And the same social media handles, you know, for, for Opex. Yeah. <clears throat> and to draw this to full circle and kind of package this all um, with words and everything. When we started this podcast, I uh, I mispronounced your last name. Oh. That was the first lessons I had. Uh, I can't recall in what if it was marketing or whatever it m- might be. If you're writing an email, if you're you're doing anything, you should always know the person's name 
and you should know how to pronounce it or how to type oh. it. Uh, so my apologies to that. Uh, and uh, yeah, you, I can only reflect and say, uh, you know, uh, and be sincere about those. Well, apologies. I appreciate so. the comment. No offense taken, <laughs> but uh, it happens all the time. Yeah. But I appreciate you thinking about it. Yeah, I, I always uh, I can lean back and say nobody can pronounce my last name. So uh, <laughs> it's uh, it, I'm in the comfort zone, at least in, in the, when I'm abroad from Sweden. So um, it was a pleasure having you on. And I I hope we um, bun, yeah, bump into each yeah. other uh, in the in the future, too. Um, are you going somewhere uh, specific? You know, any events you're going to or? Um, it, it's possible that I'll be at Wadapalooza, okay. um, you know, for that CrossFit event. Yeah. Um, we will be in Brooklyn, New York, doing a big immersion in yeah. May. Yeah. So we'll definitely be out there. Other than that, I know we have a couple of events. I'm not sure which ones I'm scheduled at yet. Yeah. So I don't actually know the rest of my yearly schedule yet. Uh, I was talking to Par uh, about doing uh i told you maybe doing like a small a coaches congress down in germany uh, we don't know when and so uh, would you be interested in yeah in, th that'd be great i i'd love to meet more coaches in uh in this neck of the woods it's awesome getting to see people face to face getting to shake hands it's i'd, I'd it'd be great yeah that's that sounds great to know get in touch with you if, if that's <laughs> maybe Paris saying like dude you're you're not there yet <laughs> but uh, it's fun um but thanks and uh, yeah let's go and watch the, the other yeah games. sounds great thanks for having me thanks. i appreciate it <laughs> yeah. i hope you